Good morning. Grace and peace to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're really glad you're able to be with us today. We want to welcome those of you who are following along with the broadcast today and uh, those of you in the internet as well. We, we always cherish the fact that you are hanging out with us and we always appreciate it when you get word back to us and, and let us know how you're doing. Uh, if you're sitting near the center, you'll find a red attendance pad and it would really help us if you would fill that out, pass it down, and we're through with it, bring them back to the center again. That makes it easy for us to collect. And you get to peek and look at the names of the people sitting in your row. That's good, too. Very good. Are you enjoying the good weather right now? I, I want you to know that I, I've ordered that specifically for you, and, and I'm really glad that, that you understand that. Hey, just a couple things coming up we want to keep before you here. Uh, one of them is this Saturday is a cleanup day here at the church. Uh, we call that fall cleanup day. And uh, trustees will be here, but it really helps if others of you would come hang out with us as well. We'll get together at 9 o'clock. Jim, were you going to make this announcement? Well, I, I can't believe I did this to you here. How many would rather hear Jim Smith talk about this than me? Yeah, come on, tell We want to hear Jim, right? Excellent. <laughs> uh, church, just remember, many hands make light work, and uh, we are going to have it starts at nine o'clock. Uh, we are going to have. Uh, I'm sure we can get someone to make some coffee, and maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, she always does a good job. She's here and has the coffee on. Uh, I'm actually going to bring some donuts. Uh, and uh, anybody comes, please come. We'll have some donuts. We'll have some fun. We'll get the church cleaned up. Do a little bit of work we got to do outside and uh, look for everyone to be here. Thank you. I, I wish you could have seen me using the church van to haul the pallet of ice belt all the way up the parking lot. Just perfect driving, I just want you to know that. All right, I'm glad you're able to, to be here. And the other thing I want to call your attention to is we're just one month away from the ladies' conference. And if you look in your bulletin, you get to see a picture of Dory Drabeck, October 18th and 19th. If you have any questions, uh, ask Jackie Wagner about it. Ask Kim about it uh, because they, uh, they're very active in getting ready for that. But, but uh, women's lives can change with events like this. And if you want to get an opportunity to get together with the body of Christ and be encouraged, I think you'll find this to be incredibly helpful. So ladies' conference, October 18th and 19th. Anything else for the good of the body that I might be missing here? Very good. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we have a few friends here from Westbury, so I'm going to have you a time of greeting and see if you can't find them here in the service, okay? Will you stand and greet one another?
when you get an opportunity to thank our acolytes for caring for us and serving in the name of Jesus, make sure you always do that. I want to invite you to stand for the call to worship. If you're able, if you are hungry, come and worship. If your spirit feels renewed, come and worship. There is healing when we come before our God. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Number 89. You may be seated. As part of our worship, we bring our tithes and offerings and we lay them before God. The ushers will wait upon you uh, as the choir leads us.
Lord, this time of year reminds us of the harvest and the bounty with which we receive. And from, Lord, that which comes into our, our being, we bring back to you. Asking, Lord, to use these gifts for your kingdom here and around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite the children to please come forward. Okay, how many of you know what this is? Football. football. How many hate football? How many don't know if you like it at all? How many like football? You don't have to like it here. You know, like you like football. Thank you. That, by the way, you, you, you're one of my best friends. I just want you to know that. Okay. So, have you ever watched a football game? Have you ever watched the, the professional game? You don't see this in a high school game. But in a professional game, when they score a touchdown, does anyone know what they sometimes do? Have you ever seen them do something with the football? All right, this is right. We're, this is where I ask the congregation. Have you ever seen them do anything with the football? S spike it. Have you ever seen them spike it? Have you seen it? Matt, Matt, did you think that you could demonstrate it? I want you to go right out there in the middle, and I want you to spike that football. We've just scored. Maddie scored. You're going to spike. Yeah. All right. Nicely done. Very nice, Maddie. I appreciate that. Nice to have you in town, too, by the way, here. I'm glad you're able to be here. Yeah, this is a football. I, I didn't get a big one to bring here today because I tell, you, I tell you why. I'm going to ask you to sign them. And the big ones had all those dimples on it. And it was too tough to be able to write on that. So I'm going to have you sign it. I, the early service, the, uh, the children in the early service uh, already did that. So they've got their, their names on. There, there's Garrett. Bye. There's Lucas is on there. Are you on there somewhere? Josiah, you get to be on both footballs, all right? Uh, I'd like you to put your name on this today, okay? And then secondly, I brought a volleyball as well because it's easier to write. And here we got Garrett. Uh, we, uh, we have Rio on here, uh, Justice, great, uh, Josiah, I don't know if you're on there. You must, oh, no, you didn't sign this one yet. Well, make sure you sign this one this next time. I'll tell you what, I keep this, I keep this in my office once you sign that, and I'll tell you why, because I want, uh, I want to be able to remember you from time to time, and whenever I put it in my office, it really says that you're my heroes. I have a picture of Daniel Boone on the wall. I have a picture of John Wesley on the wall, and I'm going to have your names on my, on my bookshelf. Do you understand that? That's important to me. Now, let me tell you why. This is the time of season where we see, uh, where, where you'll see a lot of football on TV, whether your family watches it or not. There's a lot of that going on. And one of the things that I see with, with, with sports is that when they do something good, they call attention to themselves. They say, ah! Can you do that? This, this practice hat. Ah! Exactly. That is exactly what they do. They beat their chest sometimes. They call attention to it. And that's always fun in a lot of ball games. Oh, yeah, there's the muscle man thing too, right? Yeah, you got it. You've got it. Well, that's what we see in the ball games. However, in, in, our, in our lives with following Jesus, it's a little bit different. Jesus usually says to not call attention to ourselves. So we need to leave that kind of thing <clears throat> into the world of sports and stuff. But when it comes to here at church, whenever someone is really good at it, do we expect them to go, yeah, right? No, we expect them to be humble. You know what the word humble is? The humble means that, that you don't think too highly. The, the humble means you may know that you have talent and that you have a spiritual gift and that you're good at something, but you don't call attention to yourselves in Jesus. And he told a story, or he basically was trying to instruct the Pharisees. Here's what he said. 
You know, if you ever get invited to a banquet, these are Jesus' words, if you get invited to a banquet, when you show up, don't just take the best seat at the banquet table, the one that's reserved for the, for, for the guests of honor or for the host. He says, take another seat somewhere. He says, what if you take the seat, the, the best seat in the house, and then the host of the, of the banquet comes up and says, listen, I need you to move a little bit further away because I have someone who's really very distinguished that I want to sit right there. And Jesus was trying to teach them that in the kingdom of God, we make room for everyone else. We don't think more highly of ourselves than we should. He also went on to say, if you have a banquet, uh, he said, don't just invite your relatives, your friends, your brothers and sisters, and don't just invite rich people, but invite the poor. Invite those who are broken, those who are blind, those who have disabilities. Invite them, he said, because if you invite people who can return the favor to you, he said, then that is your reward. But if you invite people who cannot return the favor, he says at the resurrection, meaning when we get to heaven, God will bless you even more uh, because you did not take those blessings right here in the earth. So this is Jesus' teaching on that, on, on, uh, on, on being humble and not being, here's a word for you that you might not use all the time, arrogant, an arrogant person who thinks that they're pretty important and they don't mind being obnoxious about it at the same time. Big words we're using here, obnoxious, arrogant, but they both have kind of a negative sound to it, all right? And uh, but Jesus is calling us to be humble. So for that reason, I'm asking you to sign a football and to sign the volleyball today. Uh, and when you go out to junior church, where I have a black magic marker and a red magic marker, and I'd like to have as many of your names as I could on these balls. Why? because you are my heroes. And if you put your name on that, I'll be reminded once again how God is working on you and I'll be remembering to pray for you. Fair enough? Let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you for the way in which you're working in the lives of, of uh, my young friends. Lord, we know how to spike the football. We know what it's like to celebrate even the slam dunk. What we have to learn all the time is how to not be filled with pride or just to be thinking that we're more important than what we really are. In the kingdom of God, Lord, the one who's important is the one who yields to everyone else. So bless my young friends and help me to get the signatures so that I can remember them in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take up the, the penny collection at this time. I like ushers that are ready to go. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. If you would turn in your hymnals to number 536, we're going to sing this together. Just remain seated while the children receive the penny collection.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are humbled to have the privilege of being able to come to you in prayer during our worship service. It's something that we should never take for granted. There are many around the world that can't gather in a church and are unable to express their Christianity to others. And Lord, even as we confess our sins, we know that you are pouring down your grace and your mercy upon us with such a love and an unconditional love that we know that you are always beside us. And Lord, we think about our pastor going to conference next week. And we pray that as he visits with family and attends his conference, that the Methodist church would be strong and they would come together as a body united in the spirit of knowing you as their Lord and Savior. Be with him as he delivers a sermon this morning. May he speak to our hearts and challenge us to be better than we were last week. And Lord, we ask that you be with Pastor Lee. For those who are cancer survivors, they know how difficult these treatments are. One day you feel wonderful, and one day it's really difficult. And the spouses, Lord, that are the caregivers, help them to be strong. And Lord, we know for many in this congregation, with this many people gathered in your sanctuary, there are needs, financial, medical, emotional, physically. And Lord, we come to you and ask that you might be able to be there for us as we turn our hearts to prayer. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do every day of our lives, including giving us a wonderful prayer that unites us this morning by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Next weekend, we will have uh, two guest speakers, by the way, and, uh, and I'm excited about both of them. Uh, Jackie Wagner will be in the pulpit at 11 o'clock, and if you were ever thinking about inviting someone uh, to come with you, that'd be the perfect time to do that. Uh, Jackie has unique gifts, and when she shares with she doesn't get very many opportunities. And when she does, we really want to maximize that. And if you're coming to the early service, 8.30, um, uh, that would be Mike Strawbridge preaching in that service as well. And some of you might want to come to both services so you get a chance to hear them. But uh, I'm trusting these faithful servants to your care, and they need to be well cared for. Thank you. The scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the, the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to your friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I often have to take a look at the congregation and find out what generation we're working with here today. 
And, uh, and when we do so, I can have an idea whether or not you remember or not. But here's my question to you. How many of you remember Muhammad Ali? I know you do. Um, how many of you are old enough to remember when he fought Sonny Liston? There is really quite a privilege in being old, isn't there, huh? Do, I don't know how many of you, you remember, but, but he was beautifully obnoxious at the end of that fight. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, he certainly knew how to call attention to himself, did he not? And quite frankly, it was part of his shtick. But uh, I've got a, a quote of what he said, and please don't expect a, an impression from me, by the way. Um, but but here's, what, here's what he said. I knew I had him in the first round. Almighty God was with me. I want everyone to bear witness. I am the greatest. I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. I don't have a mark on my face. I upset Sonny Liston and just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. I showed the world. I talk to God every day. I know the real God. I shook up the world. I'm the king of the world. You must listen to me. I am the greatest. I can't be beat. Sounds like some of the church meetings I've been to, to tell you the truth. I can't be beat. What else do you remember about him? He, uh, one other occasion, he said what many, many people have said that we just poke fun at when we do. He says, when you are so great as I am, or are as great as I am, it's hard to be humble. And I like the time he got on the airplane where, uh, where it was time to buckle up the seatbelt. Stewart is asking him to buckle the seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The uh, stewardess was pretty sharp. She came back out without missing a beat. Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> so he, uh, and the amazing thing about Ali, and, and, and you know, you remember he was, remember he was a Muslim, and, uh, and the, you know, the conscientious objector thing was really a tough thing during the, during the Vietnam War. A lot of stuff was going on. So he had his detractors and many who did not appreciate him. As the years went on though, he showed a service to mankind that was endearing to everyone. The more the Parkinson's took over, the less he spoke. And it was whenever he had the least to say that people began to hold him in such utter regard. They remembered his kindness, his generosity, and his willingness to serve men and women around the world. Um, arrogance sometimes, as it turns, turns into humility, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Having said that, I have uh, going with some of the, some of the uh, athletic illustrations today just because that's a place where we celebrate arrogance or celebrate calling attention to yourself. Uh, September 7th, 1963, that's 56 years ago, was the beginning of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now, let me just say a show of hands. How many of you like football? How many of you wish it would just go away? Yep, there are plenty of you with that too. How many of you have been guilty of wishing ill for, Anton or for, uh, you know, for, for Antonio Brown? I mean, yep, we've been doing that, haven't we? Man, what, what, what we really worry about is the things that call attention to themselves. And yet, before you're too hard on a guy like him, don't forget, our culture eats that up whenever we call attention to ourselves. Pro Football Hall of, Play, uh, Hall of Fame had 17 charter members in 1963. And I've got a couple, picture of a couple of them here. Uh, Sammy Baugh was, is, on, is on your right, and uh, Jim Thorpe is on the left. Sammy Baugh was called Slingin' Sammy. You know why it's called that? Because he's the one who, who uh, really developed uh, the forward pass. It didn't start with him, but he developed a forward pass into a powerful weapon. They say he could throw a spiral better than anyone could, and he threw for an awful lot of yards back whenever no one was doing that very much. The football at that time was fatter, and the ends were a little bit more round, and they tell me it was really hard. Uh, it was really hard to throw a spiral. There are a few of you old timers that might remember that, okay? But it was harder to throw a spiral then. And uh, Sammy Slaw, uh, <laughs> Sammy Blah, Blah, let me say his name right, um, he was really known for doing that. But Jim Thorpe is, is a name that, that, that surely uh, you've heard of him, whether you're a sports enthusiast or not. At one time, was considered the most famous athlete in the world. In fact, he was the 
first one to be the president of the NFL. He played six seasons of professional baseball. Uh, he just did everything that was athletic. But in 1912, he uh, won two gold medals, and, uh, and he stood before King Gustav V, who was the king of Sweden, and, uh, and the king said to him as he put the medal around him, he said, you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world. I can't even imagine someone ever saying that. And I don't think I should hold my breath until someone does say that to me. You are the greatest athlete in the world. Oh, I would be so obnoxious. I would let everyone, I know what it'd be like. You know what Thorpe said? Thanks, King. Not lofty language, not. Thanks, King, he said to King Gustav. Uh, or Gustav, I probably should say it that way. Talk about opportunity for arrogance, but then the, the walking of humility. Jesus had some advice about this very kind of thing. And he did it in the, in the, in the couch of talking about your seating arrangements. I, uh, he was obviously eating at the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. And, uh, and he began to tell a story. The scriptures say that he observed how people took their seat. You watch at a fellowship meal any time in the life of the church. Uh, you, you watch how people sit together. Uh, I, I've watched this for a long, long time because I want you to know I'm a veteran of many church meals, okay? I didn't say I've fixed food for many church meals. I'm a veteran of participating in church meals. And I often watch how people sit, and I'm going to make you self-conscious for the rest of your life, I know, but, but I often watch how people sit. Many times friends will sit. Oftentimes powerful people will sit with powerful people. Friends will sit with friends, but I can't tell you how many times I've noticed there's always... Uh, one or two people or one or two families that most of the people in the church don't, don't tend to go say, may I sit with you? You understand that? And I think Jesus was observing something like that. Uh, and he's at the Pharisees. These are some really powerful men, leaders in the kingdom business at that point. And, uh, and he observes that. And he says to the Pharisee, the leader of the Pharisees, listen, he says, if you have a banquet, he said, if you go to a banquet, don't sit yourself in the place of honor. You may embarrass yourself because the host may have planned for someone else to be in that place of honor and uh, you announcing that you should be in that seat is going to be very embarrassing whenever the host says, Would you, could you kindly move? Uh, I've saved this seat for someone else. Um, it's, Jesus ver uh, it's Jesus' version of the idea, awkward at best, right? So, um, and, he, and he goes on to say, uh, and he continues with this anyhow, um, he says that when you go, take a lower place or a seat uh, not as close to the front of the action or, or to the host or to the, where the guest of honor would be. Take a lower seat. Then if the host comes and says to you, hey, listen, I really planned for you to be up here in a more prominent place. Would you please come up? And then you do in front of everyone, you were honored. Now, Jesus is bit of a parable he's telling here. It isn't that he's saying seek honor. He's just saying honor is way better when it's attributed to you from someone else. But that if you decide to do it on your own, um, he said this is going to be fairly humiliating. And he kind of shows the difference between arrogance and humility. Also, and I think the flip side of that is if you're waiting for people to honor you and they never do and it makes you angry, you're still struggling with the same issue as it goes on. I uh, had the opportunity to be able to, to enjoy hanging out with, with Lee Baker just a little bit yesterday afternoon. I was watching his gym and Dwayne were finishing putting, putting the laundry together for him. And for those of you following the TV, yeah, you just need to understand, I know you're missing Lee, and, as I miss him as well around here. And uh, he, continues to, he continues to do what he needs to do for the sake of his body, but it is hard sledding and he doesn't feel very good. But... But he had a, had a moment of which he was just trying to share with me what it's like to go from being able to do anything. Uh, and I call, him my, I call him my renaissance friend. You know, he, it just wasn't too much that he hasn't experienced and too much that he hasn't done in life. And he does it well, too. And uh, he, says, he says, and he said, maybe even, and he said this very quietly, uh, but he said, maybe even I was thinking more highly of myself than I should. Now, you see, 
Now, that's interesting to come from a person like Lee because he never behaved arrogantly to, to me at all. But, but what he was saying was he felt really good about himself because what, what, what he can always accomplish. And at the moment, during this thing that he's going through at the moment, he's unable to do those kind of things. And, uh, and he was saying to me, he said, you, he said, you can share that with people. Uh, and so Lee, Lee understands that concept of, of me not trying to think more highly of myself than I need to. Uh, I love to be your pastor, but the day will come when, when uh, um, I move on, when I retire. Not yet, but that day will come. And, uh, and for me to pretend like no one can replace me is a joke. In fact, some of you are sitting back there saying, I can think of a whole bunch of people I'd like you to be replaced with. I get it. But if I fool around and think somehow that, 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 uh, uh, that I am the greatest, if I use Muhammad the Lee's uh, kind of language on that, I'm headed for a big disappointment. Do you understand that? Because God will raise up whoever he wants to raise up in order to accomplish his things in the kingdom. And quite frankly, he'll often raise up someone that we would never even dream of doing in order to make that happen. And I so appreciated Lee Baker uh, being willing to, to weigh in on that type of thing, to talk about how difficult it is uh, when we all know that we're good at something, uh, but then if, and, and if all for some reason, health-wise or whatever, it, uh, it takes away, we, we really are come to grips that our value is who we are in Christ Jesus. The fact that he paid the price for you and for me. Our value isn't on how talented we are. Our value is that he loved us so much that Jesus paid the price for us. Can I get an amen on that? Make sure you're, you're, you're living exactly that way. So that brings me to the idea that our culture does not teach humility. There's not much about our culture that will help us with that. You, you know, when, when we, we're training kids, we give them participatory, uh, you know, trophies. We want to make sure that they all get, they all get recognized. They all feel good about themselves. When, when uh, we send our kids to college, we, we'll send them anywhere, but we all want to make sure they can get into Ivy Leagues. My parents didn't have too much of a hope for that for me, but, but a lot of parents do. Uh, they, and, and we see in the news that sometimes corners are cut in order to get something like that to happen. So our culture just doesn't teach us. If, if you've ever watched reality TV, the ones who win are the ones who call the attention to themselves. If it's a bachelor or a bachelorette, it's the ones who can, can make themselves the most, uh, uh, the most attractive to, to whoever they're going. If they're getting voted off the island, it's the one who can build the alliances the best and, and get rid of other people. It calls attention to, to ourselves. That's our culture. Jesus goes on to say in Luke 14, all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Can we go to the world of politics? I've got a picture here of Bob Dole and George McGovern, two gentlemen that are no longer living. I'm not sure when Bob Dole died, but I, Govern, uh, McGovern died in, in, in uh, 2012. I think in the early service I said 1912 and I had a few people point that out to me. 2012. Um, George McGovern was a U.S. Senator. He lost to Richard Nixon in 1972, most lopsided defeat in history, at least at that time. And, uh, and of course, what happened was he had opposed the Vietnam War. And so that was just, uh, you remember all the battles on that, the battles on the home front uh, about those days. Uh, and, uh, and so he got the label falsely, I believe, he got the label of being a, a cowardly left winger. And depending on which side of the aisle you are on, on this kind of thing, you understand, um, you understand what, a, um, what a loaded type of a statement that particularly is. His own staff wanted him to be more, um, not boastful, but wanted him to talk more about his World War II experience. He was a pilot of a, of a bomber uh, in, in World War II. He knew what it was like to fly these dangerous missions. He knew what it was like to have, have uh, huge guns being pointed at him. And he, he did that faithfully in World War II. Um, but all he would say during that election was, I'm just the son of a Methodist preacher from South Dakota. He would not call attention to himself. And how many of you know, that is our hard way to get elected in our culture. You know, if you're watching the primaries right now, you know, they, they, they have to somehow call attention to them and ridicule the other uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get anywhere. And uh, so our culture doesn't help with this at all. Bob Dole, same thing from Kansas. 
He went up against Bill Clinton in the second term or run for office, 96, I believe. And, um, and he lost, and he lost in a big way. And I don't consider Bob Dole and George McGovern to be losers in any shape or form. Both were World War II vets. Both of them were my father's generation, which I admire um, again and again. Both of them, uh, but, what, but, but they began to work together. The reason I included that picture at the bottom of the screen is that McGovern and Dole were really effective in working together when it came to world hunger. Both of them, both of them were passionate about trying to end world hunger and make a difference around the world. Together, they were able to work on, on, uh, on, on making the food stamp program better. They were able to work on school lunches. They were able to, uh, they were able to make a difference with women, children, infants, uh, and, and being able to care for, for the feeding programs that helped them, so much so that around the world, and that was domestically and around the world, but so much so that, that uh, some 22 million uh, people, even to this day, in 41 countries, owe it to these two gentlemen for the things that they worked together to do. Losers? I don't think. In fact, I wonder sometimes if either one of them become president, if they wouldn't have been able to work together on the very thing that they did and the very things that they accomplished at that point in time. Those who are humble will notice the people that are in need. One of the things I notice about humble people, arrogant people look to see who is powerful. Humble people look to see those who are in need. Jesus says, when you give a luncheon, or dinner. Um, this is further on in the chapter we didn't read a little bit ago. Do not uh, invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or rich neighbors. They might return the invite and you would be repaid. He goes on to say that when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You will be blessed because they cannot pay you back and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the benefits of being faithful to, to God through the very end, through the, the salvation work of Jesus Christ, is that the things that, that were not cared for in this, this earth um, attributed to you uh, and, and, uh, and, and you receive your reward from God himself. Not just a newspaper, not just some civic, civic leader, but from God himself is where that reward will come and we'll be able to give thanks. So... There is absolutely no room in our faith for spiking the church football, so to speak. No room for excessive celebrations. I don't know how many of you ever knew Bill White. Uh, Bill White is still living. I believe he's out in India, and I think he's in Notre Dame where his son lives now. But Bill White was married to Kathy. Bill was one of our pastors in our conference. Uh, and Kathy, of course, a long time part of the camping program, Operation Sunday School at one time, uh, camping program, uh, just a great lady. And uh, I, the last church that I was at, they were both in that one before Kathy died. And I got to know she and Bill. Bill was the Lee Baker of that congregation. He was retired. And uh, he taught a Sunday school class that, that no one wanted to miss. And, and uh, we really enjoyed that. Bill White, who was very quiet, unassuming in so many ways, intelligent, gifted leader, but, but quiet the way he went about it. He, he knew how this would look so different from him, and so he had fun telling us one time. He said, just once, he said, when I'm done preaching, I would like everyone to give me a standing ovation, he goes. I would like everyone to be up clapping, and he says, and quite frankly, just like the coaches carried off the football field, I would like you at the end of my sermon to carry me. In fact, anyone want to do that today? To carry me right on out the back and, and, right, and, and right to the very, the very end. Uh, he said, just once I'd like that. And of course, he was talking about arrogance and humility. But, but if we behaved like our culture, that's exactly what we would do. And of course, you know, we were plotting the whole time. We were trying to get him in the pulpit one day and then literally carry him out. But it would have been, uh, it probably would have hurt the poor guy, you know. Maybe I want to leave you with just two more images. One of them is Jim Thorpe in front of King Gustav V. Remember, this is Sweden, 1912. This is the image where he placed the gold medal, uh, at least one of the gold medals, over him. He said, sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world. 
high praise for an athlete. Remember what he said? Thanks, King. I ask you, what are you good at? Do you know how valuable you are to this church? What is it that you are good at? Many of you know exactly what it is. In fact, um, I, we need you talented people to continue taking leadership in the life of this congregation. Not to call attention to yourself, but because you recognize what the congregation is needing of. You recognize what the pastor's weaknesses are, what other leaders' weaknesses are, and you know that you could step forward and begin to make a difference on that. You are called to do that, by the way. But leave the recognition to someone else. Do not demand your place in this world. Do not demand to have your way in that. Because I'm here to tell you, if people understand the humility that's in your life, if you are, are headed for the Humility Hall of Fame, um, you will have a greater opportunity of seeing the things that you're gifted at be used in the kingdom of God, just the way Jesus did. Last image I keep before you is a picture of Hal Kelly. This is the one that was just recently uh, in, the, in, the, in the obituary. Uh, I know that so many of you uh, have come here after 1971, but Hal Kelly was a pastor here uh, for one year, 1970 to 71. Maybe a show of hands. Are there any of you who remember Hal when he was here? Yeah. You know, that, that's meaningful to me because uh, I love that man. Um, I met him in uh, 1985 when I moved to the Erie Meadville District. He was still at Asbury United Methodist Church, and I met him then. Uh, and, and, of course, this is while I was out in Harbor Creek, South Harbor Creek. He had, he had built the education building there in, in the early 60s. And, uh, and I was left with the task of, of starting to work on worship space up there. And uh, he and I spent a lot of time as we talked about what he had planned and, and what it had taken 40 years since he had done that for the congregation to get to the place where they wanted to get. So, so Hal was special. When we, when we broke ground, uh, he, had done just, uh, he had done just that. He and Peg had come, and, and they were still living in DeWittville up around Chautauqua uh, at that time. And he would come and participate with us. And, and he always treated me, always treated me with respect. A few times he said, I don't agree with what you're doing, Larry, and I paid attention whenever he would say that, okay? But he was that capable. These last years, since 2007, he's been at Westbury. He and Peg both. Peg is still there. But I wanted to, to remind you, since so many of you would not have met Hal, uh, don't, don't think that it was a failure whenever he was only here one year. He was called to go to the Franklin District after he had been here one year. But in that one year, also, uh, his son, Greg, played, uh, played football, uh, Buck Crabb had him his senior year, and I want you to know, uh, I want you to know that that, uh, that that Greg, his son Greg, became a Navy SEAL as well. So we'll we'll give Buck the credit for that. Does that sound okay? Um, but but the, it's just an accomplished family, and very proud. So I went got to be got to be at the funeral there the other day, and. Uh, Sarah Roncolato, our pastor at Stone United Methodist Church, led, and she did a masterful job. But, but I liked what she did because I learned something from Sarah at that point. Uh, how, being the administrator he is, had everything laid out for the way the, the service had to go. And there wasn't going to be any hoopla. There wasn't going to be the kind of things that sometimes we do as we have going away, send away thing for people. Uh, he laid out the songs that he wanted to have sung, and they were beautiful, worshipful songs. He laid out some of the prayers that needed to be part of that. And he wanted to make sure that the conversation was all about heaven and, 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 and what it was that Christ had done for us and how we get to be with him forever and ever and ever. So Sarah did exactly what I think I would do uh, in the sense that she says, I really want to talk about how. She said, and, and, and uh, by the way, when you folks see uh, Sarah tell it, I just really appreciate the way she did it. She said, if it were me, I would want to talk about, and she named all the things I'm naming. Pretty clever on her part. But she said, Hal wants me to talk about. So she was able to do both. As we realized what a tremendous gentleman he was, and also, uh, and also uh, what his attention was to call to the attention to God and not to himself. That's the kind of legacy that's left on here. So that you can place it, by the way, if 7071 doesn't matter. That was whenever Jack Spencer had left and before, before Shingle Decker came to be the pastor. So I just wanted to place that in the history books for you so you'd be able to understand that. And uh, I want to give God thanks for how uh, life today. And I thought that since he is one of our pastors and it impacted us right here, that we would close with just a little bit of prayer, uh, giving God thanks for how's life. He 
is not going to call attention to himself ever. It wasn't his style. But we need to give God thanks for those that are in the Humility Hall of Fame that have shown us how to serve Jesus and not call attention to ourselves. Can we pray? Lord, we give you thanks for Hal and Peg and their family. The ones in our congregation who can remember those days, 45 years ago, 50, I don't know, just so many years. We give you thanks for the impact that he made here in the short amount of time he was here. But we realize that he was called to the church generally around the conference. And so many people have been impacted, including me. We are asking, Lord, that, that you would allow us to adopt the humility that I believe he had. Not to be mistaken for lack of strength, he was a strong, um, courageous individual. Whether it be on the football field, which he was good at, or whether it be in a boardroom, or whether it be in the church. Uh, as strong as what he was, he called attention to you. And Lord, that's the guidance that we are looking. Same way with our brother Lee Baker, as he is simply saying, calling attention to you and not to ourselves. I give you thanks for these mighty men, these mighty valiant men, and, uh, and the women that, that have done the very same thing in our history and in our past. And I ask that you call us, Lord, to understand that the ones who are great in the kingdom of God are the ones who serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was looking at the music that we'd be singing today, and though it's not a communion Sunday, I looked at the words of let us break bread together. And uh, I'm gonna ask that you turn in your hymnals to 618, and that we sing this song together. Let us break bread together. We stand. You, First United Methodist Church, are the greatest, but only because you know how to serve. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.